Okay, everybody, by my clock, I see two o'clock. Um, so we'll get started. Um, I have on the screen right here, um, just a couple of our reminders um, that are here. Um, I've added a few, uh, just uh, things that we've always, always uh, done, but never stated. So just putting it there for perspective. Um, obviously, please mute and unmute appropriately. Uh, do not go on hold uh, if you're on the phone. Um, and then I have uh, some just, you know, be respectful. One person talks at a time. It's okay to disagree. All that stuff that we've been doing really well, but I'm now stating it down there. Um, I attended a forum a while back. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's pretty good to put up there. We should probably do that for our meetings. Um, we'll have public comment on items not listed on the agenda. And then also we'll take comment on items listed on the agenda. Uh, you could raise your hand if you choose uh, through Zoom. Uh, which is the reactions tab um, and click raise hand. If you wanna speak on something or if you're on the phone, um, you can press star nine um, and uh, do that as well um, or unmute if you choose and, and we'll, uh, we'll call on you when, when the time's right. We're recording the meeting. I made sure to not forget to record the meeting and uh, meeting materials are available that are being presented are available on the website at turlockgroundwater.org. With that being said now, I will hand off to, to um, leadership, Michael, Kevin, Karen, feel free and run your meeting. Thank you, Herb. I've got Kevin and I here will we'll jointly run the meeting. Um, I've checked through the list and we have at least eight agencies in the West Turlock area. We have TID, Denair, City of Turlock, Hillmore County, Water District, Merced County, uh, Landrum from Delhi, Stanislaus County, and the City of Ceres. So having said that at 2.02, I'll call the meeting of the West Turlock Subbasin Groundwater S Sustainability Agency Technical Advisory Committee to order. Over to you, Kevin, for the east side. Uh, thank you, Michael. And I, I see Walt and uh, Dennis, Brody, and Lacey, I think is on there too. So we have a quorum on, on the east side so we'll call the meeting to order at 202 as well. Thank you. Wonderful. So our first item on the agenda is number four, public participation. This is the time set aside for members of the public to directly address the, the technical advisory committee on any item of interest to the public that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the technical advisory committee. Um, you can speak now if you, if you do want to talk on an item that's on the agenda, you can hold those comments till later or speak now, it's up to you. So with that, is there any public participation? Any hands raised, uh, Herb? I'm not seeing any uh, at current, um, but if anybody, uh, just in case, if anybody does wanna speak, now is the time to do it. If you wanna go off of mute, you don't need to raise your hand. It's always just nice for organization's sake. Well, it sounds like um, nothing under public, public participation. So we'll go to item number five, sustainable management criteria, where the joint TAC will consider and make a recommendation on minimum thresholds and monitoring strategies for the land subsidence sustainability indicator. And with that, we'll hand over to Phyllis Stanin of Todd Groundwater. Thank you, Phyllis. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. I'll get this up on my screen and we will take a look. We just have one slide to see today. And um, can everyone see my slide? Yes. Thank you. Um, let's get a, a little bit of larger here so that we can focus on this. So um, if you attended our last TAC meeting, um, Liz did an excellent job, I hear, at presenting the details of the subsidence um, undesirable result framework that we had put together. And I think that um, I won't repeat any of the information that she provided. But um, she was recommending from the technical team that we look at the Western Lower Principal Aquifer and set the minimum threshold um, at the <clears throat> top of the Corcoran clay and that we adopt a framework that we had previously put together that um, looks at an exceedance of a minimum threshold at a designated percentage of land subsidence monitoring locations and um, the monitoring locations, as everyone knows, is currently in flux. So we don't quite know the number 
of monitoring locations that we're going to have. At this point, we have something on the order of about eight locations. And we would be looking at the MT at those locations and, and an exceedance of that in two consecutive spring monitoring events to trigger an undesirable result. So, um, and then the, the definition that we have all uh, talked about for the uh, undesirable result for inelastic land subsidence is repeated at the top of this slide. Um, um, in addition to setting the MT at the top of the Corcoran clay, and in addition to agreeing on the monitoring framework, whereby we would be looking at an exceedance of MT in a percentage of monitoring locations and during two consecutive spring monitoring events, we also um, wanted to recognize that there are some additional monitoring strategies uh, that we are proposing. In addition to groundwater elevation monitoring specifically, uh, we uh, were recommending that we also supplement that with a review of additional screening level data. So this would be just on a screening basis only that we would be looking at two data sets that are publicly available. One being the INSAR satellite remote imagery uh, available that DWR has been publishing on an annual basis and also a uh, high quality uh, global positioning system station, a GPS station that USBR uh, has been monitoring. And so that would give us additional information to bolster our understanding from the groundwater elevations that are part of the monitoring program. Uh, recognizing that there may be additional monitoring strategies in the future, uh, if additional GPS stations are installed in the basin and also recognizing that there may be the opportunity to pull in additional monitoring wells as they are drilled and installed in the Western Lower Principal Aquifer. This information has now been vetted and discussed uh, at length with the ad hoc committee. And my understanding is that the ad hoc committee is comfortable with the technical recommendations being made from our team and so I wanted to put this in front of the TAC today for the full tax consideration and um, approval uh, if so warranted. Um, and so I will turn it back over to Michael to um, uh, see if there's any additional questions and or to recommend TAC, TAC action. Thank you, Phyllis, and a great follow up on the wonderful presentation we got from Liz at our last meeting. So with that, any, any questions for Phyllis? Obviously, we're looking at looking for land subsidence based on water levels above the Corcoran and then double checking that or cross referencing that with actual um, uh, ground level monitoring, fusion INSAR, and other uh, interesting technology. So, uh, we have a quest question is what's an MT, so a minimum threshold? So, um, maybe Phyllis, we've got a, a question in the chat box what is an MT and how does that work? That's a good question for the public there. Sure. So a, a minimum threshold is a quantitative measurement by which we will uh, use to identify groundwater conditions that we want to avoid. And those are in uh, the, the terminology of sigma defined as undesirable results. So the minimum threshold is the quantitative measurement that defines undesirable results, and in particular for this sustainability indicator, land subsidence. Uh, and it's just, Rhett has a question, it relates to that, it's like he doesn't, where he, where he lives or where he, where he uh, has a well, doesn't know where that is in, re, in reference to the Corcoran clay. So he's at Quincy and Service, so that's northeast of Turlock, I'm guessing up towards Ceres. I don't feel it's kind of a, Tough question, but I don't know if you have any of your slides available you can access to to maybe show the um, presentation from last night. I think because I had the cork and clay, the eastern extent on it. Yes, let's uh, let's show this. Give me one second. Um, can you see the map yet? Yep, we can. Okay, so here's the city of Turlock outlined here. This is 99. And the red line that you see that's dashed and runs through this area is the approximate extent of the Corcoran clay, whereby on this side of the line to the west, 
in the subsurface, we have this clay lens called the Corcoran clay. And that uh, actually deepens and thickens to the west and, as, and also rises and thins to the east. And east of this line, in general, we don't see that typical uh, blue plastic Corcoran clay. So it looks like um, where Rhett is, uh, that's the questioner from the public. His his property is not even, it'd be, the east, it'd be east of Santa Fe and, and Gear. So it wouldn't be in the area that has a coal from clay level. That's right. So this minimum threshold would not be applicable to his work. Right. I, I think he's, he's moving on to the next question, which we haven't got to yet, is you know, having a groundwater level of that area, how would it affect rural domestic? Wells, and so one of the one of the criteria, sustainability criteria, we have to get to. We haven't got there yet. Is uh, groundwater levels, and I know this is kind of a little bit off topic, but having this great public engagement is always a good thing. Maybe Phyllis, you want to talk about that a little bit right now? If you can see the chat box, you can see that question. But it's a great opportunity to to get the message out. Yeah, yeah, yes, thank you. So um, as we've discussed before, there are six sustainability indicators that have been defined in Sigma, and those represent groundwater conditions that you'd like to avoid if those are, if those conditions become significant and unreasonable. And land subsidence is the one that we're talking about today, but there is also another sustainability indicator that's referred to as the chronic lowering of groundwater levels. And we have talked, um, really over the, the past year or so about all of the sustainability indicators, including the chronic lowering of water levels. And in particular, we have talked about how some of the declines that we have seen in water levels have created some adverse impacts to some of the wells in the area. Many of the domestic wells that had issues during the drought of record uh, were replaced and have been drilled. And we are going to be working with uh, the ad hoc committee and this TAC uh, on def better defining a minimum threshold for the chronic lowering of water levels. And that's coming up in the next um, several months. We're going to be defining uh, detailed minimum thresholds for all of our sustainability indicators, including the chronic lowering of water levels. This is Rhett. Do you hear me? I do hear you. Hello. Yeah, go ahead, Rhett. Um, so I'm interested in the minimum thresholds for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, let's just be selfish. My domestic well um, in in setting a minimum threshold, if we're looking at land subsidence, isn't that something that occurs after wells go dry? Uh, the first indication of too much pumping is domestic wells go dry, and then second is uh, land sus subsidence. Um, is that correct, or am I not correct? Um, well, that certainly can happen. Uh, it doesn't mean it, it has to happen and it doesn't happen necessarily in that order everywhere. So uh, it, it sort of just depends on where you are. Um, your area outside of that dashed red line is indicative of, from a technical perspective, of not being in an area where there are uh, regionally extensive and thick clays that are plastic in nature and are subject to dewatering, depressurization, and or compaction. And when you have declining water levels in the subsurface that affect these sort of regional clay layers, that's when you uh, compact in the subsurface and the land sinks. So that's the subsidence piece of it. And that could occur uh, if a domestic well is completely uh, saturated without any problems, 
Uh, it only has to do with the clay, not so much with the wells that are in the area. Um, there, there are areas where you can have a domestic well impacted first and then later see subsidence. But in this particular case, um, it would be uh, unlikely that you would see significant land subsidence based on the sediments that are beneath your area. I'm not exactly sure where you are, but if you're uh, near Greer and Santa Fe Avenue, that would probably be a less likely scenario than what we're talking about right now. Yes, I would be near Gear and Santa Fe, uh, roughly in that map. Um, I, I'm concerned with groundwater depletion. I've seen it accelerate over the last 20 years in my lo location. And uh, I, I, I'm worried about the whole region, uh, but I, I like to be selfish because I can, I can link my selfish things back to uh, examples that have happened to me in the past. So I have had my groundwater uh, lower than that, but my domestic pump, which is fairly new, uh, 2004, uh, was dry. And w we've had some, you know, some weather experience that's unique going forward uh, we're going to have more unique situations with uh, climate change at least that's what the scientists tell us and so we have uh, uh, kind of a fragile access to groundwater in the rural area if if levels are going to change up and down and mostly down over the coming decades we're going to have a really difficult time accessing groundwater. Um, I think the most urgent need is for our domestic groundwater. I, I, if we're out of water here at my house, I think we're going to be in a hotel pretty quick. Uh, that's concerning. Uh, and then obviously the ag uh, use uh, which in the Turlock Irrigation District, we call it conjunctive, uh, where we have, hey, you're lucky you have access to surface water. And you also have access to groundwater, but going forward, maybe that access to groundwater is more fragile and it's regulated and we have to meter it and, and all that. But back to the minimum thresholds, uh, when we're talking about subsidence, that seems like an extreme ex event. So obviously we don't want to get close to subsidence. Backing off subsidence, we don't want to get close to dewatering domestic wells. Um, that counts for municipal domestic wells which would be, you know, employed by Keys and Houston, Ceres, even Turlock with, you know, even Ceres and Turlock with their surface water augmentation that they plan going forward, uh, there's still going to be use of groundwater for domestic use. Um, so I, I know this is what this whole thing is about. It's about uh, getting to a sustainable thing. And my interest is making sure there's some logic to how fragile this access to groundwater is for a number of us, if not all of us. We're all, it, it's a very expensive infrastructure that each of us and all of us together have in this access to groundwater. We certainly want to set minimum thresholds so that they're generous enough we can, we don't have to expend significant amounts of capital to get back to uh, what may have been an incorrect setting of a minimum threshold. Anyway, that's, that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rhett. That's exactly, you, you, you hit the nail on the head when you said that's what this is all about. And I don't know if you've had the opportunity to attend previously. I'm sorry, there's usually a long list and I'm not exactly sure who has been attending 
but we've certainly um, focused quite a bit on the domestic well issues. And in, in particular, there were a number of wells that were impacted during this most recent drought of record, the 2013 to 2016 timeframe was a very difficult time for many domestic well owners, not only in this subbasin, but all, all along the Central Valley. So we have focused on that and we have put together quite a bit of information on that. And we are very cognizant of adverse impacts to municipal and domestic wells. And we'll be considering that in setting minimum thresholds for chronic lowering of water levels. Um, we're going to be setting minimum thresholds for all of the sustainability indicators. And so that's, um, that's, that's all. Uh, we, we've talked a lot about it, and we're going to be doing the quantitative uh, assignments very shortly. So stay tuned. All right. Thank you, Red. Thank you, Phyllis. Are there any more questions for Phyllis on the sustainable management criteria for the um, for subsidence and the, the, the wording that Phyllis and the team with the ad hoc TAC committee put together. Okay, I hear the sound of silence. So with that, this is actually an action item and uh, which will be added to the groundwater sustainability plan. Um, so we need um, a motion from both the West Turlock TAC and the East Turlock TAC to adopt this as our um, undesirable result and monitoring strategies. So do I have a motion from anybody? Yeah, this is Walt Ward. I'll make the motion to approve the uh, sustainable management criteria to advance the plans. Okay, it sounds like a, a, a motion from Walt and a second from Curtis. Um, with that, any other discussion? We'll go to a vote. Okay, so all those in favor of the of the action signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed on the West Turlock? Any abstentions? Okay, motion stands approved. Over to you, Kevin. Well, thanks, Michael. Uh, so does the East uh, Turlock Subbasin GSA TAC want to follow suit with a motion? I'll make the same motion, Kevin. Thank you, Walt. And this is Brody. I can second that. Thank you, Brody. Any further discussion or questions? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone against? Not hearing anyone against, it passes unanimously. Thank you. I thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Phyllis. Moving on to item number six, project schedule. Discussion regarding project schedule and timeline and the tax process for compiling and incorporating comments into the draft groundworks, groundwater sustainability plan. Okay, uh, Debbie, over to you. Thank you. Okay, let me see if I can share my screen. Give me just a sec. I have a little bit of a presentation, not a lot, but okay. So I'm assuming everyone can see this. So let me make it a little bigger, maybe. Okay, hold on. Okay, I think I think that works. Um, does that work? Yeah, we see the full screen version, Debbie. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, so um. You've all seen this uh, slide before. Phyllis shared this with us in February, and it um, it represents a, a revised um, schedule that uh, she put together to move us through the remaining process. Remember, we um, need to uh, get to uh, adopting the the GSP in January and submitting it to DWR. And so um, this represents the, the various um, sections uh, that will be developed for the GSP. Um, and uh, you know, back in January, uh, the consultant team provided a draft of, um, of this first group of three chapters to the 
technical advisory committee for for review. Um, and uh, and so that's that that start of that green bar here. There was intended to be a an eleven week uh, review period that included um, three weeks for the the technical advisory committee to review and provide comments. Um, there and there were two weeks for incorporating those comments, and then bringing it to the the GSE boards for them to. Um, understand what's included in it and then release it for public review. Then there would be a, a four week public review process and then an additional two weeks at the end to kind of work through any public comments that we received or comments from the GSA. Um, and then taking perhaps some action at the end of this green bar to um, uh, finalize each of the sections as you move forward. And so you, you see the first the first section, which included um, some administrative stuff and, and the basin setting. Then the next green bar represents the water budget and um, groundwater model section of the GFP. And then, um, uh, and then you went through the sustainable management criteria with an initial review of, of that section, recognizing that we had the opportunity to make adjustments to that as we move forward. So, so keep that in mind as we talk a little bit later. Um, and then uh, the final green bar includes the last four chapters, which includes the sustainable management criteria, monitoring networks, projects and management actions, and the implementation plan. So that's a, another big chunk at the end um, with the idea that we would finish the, the review and, um, and then have a little bit of time at the end to finalize and incorporate comments and, and wrap up the GSP, do additional outreach, oops, sorry. Um, and then have an opportunity for the member agencies of the two GSAs to perhaps take action in December of, of this year to support a, the um, uh, approval of, of the GSP. Um, prior to the GSAs taking action. Um, so that's the overall process. As we've gone through um, reviewing the basin setting and developing comments, um, uh, it's become clear that um, it's gonna take a little more than 11 weeks uh, to go through this process just because we have two GSAs, and so these individual GSAs probably have to work together to, to figure out what comments from their individual agencies or consultants might be avail available and, and need to be incorporated, and then confer and work together to figure out how to make adjustments and recommendations to um, uh, the TAC on the TAC's comments, and then uh, to the GSAs on the, the public comments as we move forward. So we can give direction to the consultant team um, on how to do that. And, and that is a process we hadn't really talked about before, but um, the, the plan is to um, uh, work through this basin setting section to understand kind of the timelines and how it impacts it, and then make adjustments as we move forward to the rest of this to make sure we kind of stay within the overall timeline that we have and to, um, to work through the kinks in that process. Um, so, so there's that. The, the other thing I wanted to um, bring to the, the group is that um, the plan, uh, I think, is to utilize the ad hoc committee to be able to work through some of that and bring recommendations back to the TAC. So, um, so we can kind of work through all those comments and then bring recommendations to the TAC of, okay, we got these comments. This is what we're recommending as far as changes to, um, to the, the chapters um, and, and then get, you know, kind of direction from the overall TAC. So everyone has the option and, and work through that process, but it's, it's difficult to, to do that um, in a larger setting because there's potentially like lots of comments to work through. So, um, so that's, that's the concept. And so um, I'll stop there 
for now and, and get some feedback on, on that item. Feedback to, to Debbie on the, the timeline and, and the process for making comments. Anybody? Hi, this is, hi, this is Rhett. Oh, hi, Rhett. Hi. Um, I'm a little lost in all this. Bear with me. Um, focused on projects and management actions. I've heard, I've been involved. Well, I'm listening in the background to some meetings on the groundwater, and um, I'm trying to get up to speed now. I've heard projects mentioned that would be something like, hey, we're going to get TID to put some groundwater on this soccer field, and then we're going to get credit for that because we we spent the capital to get that infrastructure built so that that soccer field could get wet in Turlock. So now I get that water out of the Turlock groundwater. That was a project that I heard proposed. Is this, is this typical of what we're talking about in this section, projects and management actions? Mike, you want to take that one? I was hoping you would. But, um, <laughs> okay. Kevin. I can. Like. You go ahead. You go ahead, Debbie. Then Kevin, you want to join in after that? Sure. 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 Okay. So um, we just started on the, the project and management actions section. Um, it could be a number of things, and there may not be um, there, some may be more um, general. Um, while others at, that need to be developed over time, and, and there may be other specific projects that we incorporate as well. Um, and so uh, I, I don't have a specific, I, I hadn't heard that specific example, um, uh, but there have been discussions with respect to um, finding ways of making use of um, uh, surface water resources to have a more dedicated recharge program than than what the district has done in the past with respect to conjunctive use, um, which would help um, increase the amount of, of water that we get into the ground. Um, but it could that could include a variety of projects. So um, I hope I hope that helps. Well, Debbie, just before we leave that and go over to Kevin, do you want to mention yeah, real quickly the the, gra the groundwater recharge mm -hmm. assessment tool and what we're what we're doing right now sure um so we uh we received a grant to uh develop what they called a grat or a groundwater recharge assessment tool and it's a tool that's been implemented elsewhere in the valley um mainly to the south um that uh can be used to identify uh key locations where we could get um, water into the ground using a variety of, of mechanisms, whether it be a recharge basin or um, uh, ag land uh, or um, even a stormwater basin for that matter. And, um, and so it can help you focus and develop programs to, to maximize recharge in, 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 um, in the basin. And so we're implementing that tool so at first it'll be a little bit of a planning tool, and then later it can be evolved into an operational tool. So say you have a certain amount of storm water that you can move into the basin, how do you make the best use of it? And so we're, we're, we're working on those types of tools to help facilitate the recharge within the basin. Okay, a follow-up question. Um, and this, yes. gets pol this may get political, I, I don't know, I'm not, up to speed on east versus west GSA within the Turlock Basin. But here we go. So if I'm in the east basin, then I think my incentive is to spend capital to get surface water to recharge groundwater. 
if I'm not in the East Basin, and I'm not, I'm in the West Basin, then my incentive, and it is my incentive, that we use surface water to recharge in the West Basin, and the West Basin gets credit for the surface water that we already have access to. Am I incorrect, or am I out of line, or are we all together on this? Or are we, uh, are we working at opposite ends of, of a, a uh, political problem here when we put East Basin and West Basin together and trying to agree on how we're going to solve the groundwater levels in the Turlock Basin? Prep, before we answer that and hold maybe in part, we have Kevin Kaufman here. He's the um, representative for the East Turlock Subbasin and Sustainability Agency. Maybe Kevin can give an overview of some of the programs they're looking at there on the east side to address the overdraft. Uh, thank you, Michael. Yeah, Rhett, uh, I don't think you're far off. Um, I would word it a little bit differently, but yeah, the uh, the east is is challenged in that it doesn't have any water supplies, surface water supplies. So yes, a lot of their capital will be expended to purchase uh, surface water supplies in order to try to balance the basin. So. I, I think you're right on, on the second point. As far as the first point, I, I think you're right too that soccer fields in, in the city of Turlock are, are, are good, good options for taking stormwater and they're already designed to do that. But it's taking surface water, not taking groundwater. That would be the only change that I would made, make to your comment. But, uh, and I agree with everything that um, Debbie said about the GRAT tool and it's, it's defining projects. But just a couple of examples. Um, the West uh, GSA does have uh, the water, so it's going to be easier for the West GSA to uh, capitalize uh, balancing uh, the groundwater basin on, on the West side. Um, one of the biggest projects coming up that's going to be in the management actions is the project that hopefully will start being built this summer, and that's the uh, joint drinking water treatment plant for the city of um, Turlock series and a number of other uh, communities. That'll take surface water to those communities that have relied primarily on groundwater over the years. So that's a, that's a big, big shift. That's a big management action that we'll be taking. And some of the other projects um, that we're looking at, um, a project was recently installed by Eastside Water District, part of the East Turlock Subbasin GSA uh, membership uh, at, at the Mustang Reservoir um, this past summer. And it started recharging water, uh, stormwater that flows down Mustang Creek behind uh, Mustang Reservoir um, east of uh, Montpelier and north of uh, East Avenue. And you know, it's not a huge project, but eventually as water supplies are made available or purchased, it, it could become a, a huge project. So there's going to be a number of management actions that take surface water, try to store it, uh, put it in the ground to uh, balance groundwater levels uh, over the years. And, and it's going to take time. It may take 20 or 30 years to reach sustainability. But that's, that's part of the plan and that's why we're putting this plan together. And I hope this information helps. Did that answer your question, Rhett? Yes, that's uh, close enough for now. I appreciate it, thank you. Good, thank you. And Michael Cook, this is Valerie. I just had one thought on that. When obviously that chapter is yet to be written, but there are several Sigma requirements that when you write it, you have to identify a number of things that are kind of interesting. Um, the timing, the you know regulatory approvals you need, who would do the project, who would fund it. So really as just those simple kind of disclosure requirements, um, hopefully we'll shake out projects that are, you know, ones that are kind of shovel ready, ones that are medium priority, maybe down the line in five years, and then those that are more conceptual because um, remember that we can put projects into the GSP and you don't have to do the EIR 
for them, but before you implement them, you do. So you'll have to evaluate, you know, how many soccer players you get wet at some point, but not in the GSP. So um, there, there are some requirements and it'll probably weed out some of the projects. Thank you, Valerie, that's helpful too. And then, as you know, as Debbie was showing here on the on the timeline for the schedule, it's it's a tight timeline. We've got a lot of work to do, obviously, to get this in on time to DWR, and we have to do that. There's no shifting of schedule. So, uh, just so everybody knows, Turlock Irrigation District now has a contract with Montgomery and Associates, and the main person we'll we'll be working with is Derek Williams. He'll be helping to um, provide comments. You know, ostensibly on behalf of TID, but by extension, the West Turlock Sub Basin GSA to help us, you know, make timely comments so we can keep the Todd uh, groundwater team on track with uh, developing the GSP. I'm sure, like you, no one's got a whole bunch of extra time in their schedule right now to spend a lot of time leafing through the GSP and, and getting comments in on time. And so, in order to keep this project on track, uh, TID has has a contract with Montgomery and Associates. So hopefully that's that's it's a can be helpful for TID and the West Sherlock and ultimately for the joint TAC so that we can all be reviewing comments at the same time, getting the right back and forth, and then getting the you know the, the chapters done quickly and efficiently and timely in, in a manner that is good for everybody. So I just want to update the team on that while it was in my mind and, and Debbie was talking about schedule. Hey, good, good add in, uh, Michael, uh, Kevin here again. The um, going back to Debbie's question, I I, I think the uh, the ad hoc uh, TAC um, process is is going to help a lot with uh, getting the re review sped up a little bit. I think the first three chapters of the GSP were difficult in that it was a training for, for us all. And, and I'm not sure the other chapters are gonna be as intense. Uh, so I think I wouldn't be too uh, down on how long it might take, but I think it's gonna take a concerted effort on all parties, all members of both GSAs to uh, be timely for the next uh, uh, seven, eight months um, because, you know, we, we can't uh, let what happened with the first three chapters happen in all the chapters. I, I agree with Debbie. Um, I, I don't know what else we can do besides that at this point is just to make a commit, commitment to recommit to being timely. Okay. Thank you, you Kevin. Nail, that, I think you hit the nail on the head. Sorry, Debbie. It's good. And, and I appreciate that because you're right. Um, Cause that is one of my messages is, is that we need to keep moving on. Um, and, and, and we're going to learn from the, the process that we've had over the, the first three chapters and, and continue to um, evolve this, this schedule. So, so recognize that the other thing we're going to do is we're going to remind everyone at, at each of the meetings or at least once a month about where we are and where we're going and what's next. So let's talk a little bit about that, okay? Um, so if I can move, this is um, another slide you've seen and it lists all of the, the, the scheduled meetings that we, we've had um, for the tax as well as um, the, the potential ad hoc meetings and, and the GSA meetings. And, and you can see that they were kind of on a, a regular schedule. Um, I think there's going to need to be a little more flexibility um, in order to be able to make this work because otherwise, um, you know, as I've been going through and I'll show you an example of what I've been working on um, to get a, a more detailed schedule about what we're going to be talking about at each of the meetings and making sure that we're able to kind of move us along according to the previous schedule you just saw. It, it, we're going to need some interim meetings in between some of these to kind of move things along and, and get um, action uh, and decisions from the TAC. And so my, my request is that, um, that as we refine this, I, I'm gonna try to identify some key places where we need additional meetings. But if um, the TAC members could try and leave Thursdays at two o'clock open as much as possible, 
it gives us flexibility. So if we need to add a special meeting in, we can do that. And it keep moving this process forward because waiting a few weeks to have a meeting could be detrimental because we don't have that many months left. So, so that's my ask. Um, and then for the ad hoc meetings, um, we have a, a general schedule for those, but um, we can be a little more nimble with that because there's less people to try to coordinate. But um, to, to take any action at the tax, we need to have a quorum and that, that takes you know, having enough people there. So, so that would be my ask and I'll stop there and have conversation. Thank you, Debbie. Any questions on that? So if you could kind of block out as many Thursdays as you can, Thursday afternoons from two onwards, uh, that would be good. Um, and I think Kevin made a good point. None of us have gone through developing a GSP before, right? We're all new to this and the first few chapters were hard, but I think, again, it's kind of a training exercise too. Uh, I think we're developing the structures and organization now to be a little bit more um, responsive and organized. And I appreciate what Debbie's done here by laying everything out visually and graphically so we can really kind of see what's ahead of us. There's a lot of meetings and it's gonna be a lot of work, but um, okay, it's unprecedented. We've never done this before. And I think we'll be pretty pleased at the end of what we can accomplish if we keep working together like we like we have and, and will do. Anything else on the schedule from anybody? I, I've got one more slide. Go ahead, Debbie, sorry. It's all right. Um, so this is what um, we've been working through and I wanna um, kind of talk a little bit about it. So, so we're developing a, a list of all the meetings and what the topics are going to be. So um, the plan is is to, to to line the rest of them out. This is just an example through through next meeting. So it kind of shows what what the plan is, which is a climate change scenario discussion, um, and then the ad hoc meeting before that, where we're, we're going to talk about the, the preview the slides and give feedback and get input from the technical team so we can provide some recommendations back to the TAC. Um, and so we're going to have this kind of laid out on um, on the website and it'll but it'll change. So over time, there may be a situation where things get pushed, like, for example, the red here from the last meeting we had, we didn't make the decision on the minimum threshold. It got pushed to um, to today's meeting. And so um, you can see here that it got added in. And so this is gonna evolve over time. So recognize that, but it gives people an idea about what's happening at the next meeting and what to expect as we move forward. So they can be thinking about how to provide input and feedback. Um, so, uh, and also, um, and I'm, I'm working with Herb on figuring out where to put this, um, but, but I think it'll be helpful. And also quite frankly, people can then maybe take a look at this and they're thinking, well, when did we talk about climate change? They can go back and look at this list and then go back to the calendar and find the presentations and that sort of thing. So that might be helpful as well for folks. I'll, I'll stop there. This is very, very helpful, Debbie. I really do appreciate it. Any questions for Debbie? Okay, one last thing, sorry, and then I'll let you go. <laughs> Please apologize, go right ahead. <laughs> um, so the next thing that we really have to get through, and we took one action today, which is dealing with um, subsidence and, and the minimum thresholds there is, is establishing those minimum thresholds and other sustainable management criteria so that we can start developing the sustainable management criteria section draft. That's so that's going to be key in the coming meetings. I know we've talked about it over the past year. We've developed some technical memos. We're going to use those, but we have to have actions by the TAC um, in order to be able to move forward. And, and I know there's been some hesitancy, I think, um, uh, to, to make a decision because we didn't understand how it relates to something else. 
But as I understand it in, in talking with Phyllis over time, it, it all works together and, and we have to have something in place so that she can draft it so we can all see. And so it's kind of a bit of a chicken and an egg kind of thing. You have to make that decision in order to be able to see how it all fits together. And, and we're going to have the opportunity to, um, to revise it and relook at it. And you saw that in um, the, the schedule here, right? We had this initial draft, but then we have an opportunity to revise it and then it'll be reviewed again. And so to so remember that as we move through making these initial first decisions, okay? So that's all I had. <laughs> Okay. I mean, this Kevin, I agree with Michael that that, that new um, table that you're using to define the topics of when they will be um, considered by I the ad hoc it. and the um, TAC is, is, I think, will be very helpful. And thank you. Thank you for putting that together. Um, and it goes, the example I would go back to is Rhett's questions earlier on about the um, chronic lowering of groundwater levels as compared to the, the MT that we talked about today, the minimum threshold that we talked about today, is that when, when you talked about that opportunity to make changes, if we, if we get to that point and we recognize there's a conflict between the MTs for, for whatever reason, that's, that's the time they'll be adjusted so they're all compatible. So, so I think uh, the process is becoming a little bit more clear. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. All right, with that, um, that's project schedule. Moving on to number seven, Sigma related updates. It's where we tack just kind of an open floor to discuss and provide updates on items related to Sigma. Um, no actions taken on these. Do we have a public outreach date or a grant update? Michael, this is Herb. Go ahead, Herb. I'll just add that um, one where we, we received authorization, I want to say last week uh, at, at the last TAC meeting at the March 11th TAC meeting to complete the, uh, the, not, the facilitation support services application to submit to DWR and the ad hoc group was, was ta the ad hoc communications committee was tasked with taking a look at that. So we're going to meet Friday to talk about it. Uh, I've started drafting up some general language for us to discuss, and then we're moving along on that. So probably going to likely give you an update on that, give this group an update on that every meeting um, that we have the opportunity. So that's moving forward. Hope to get some uh, assistance for that for facilitation for the remainder of 2021 uh, related to GSP uh, comments and GSP outreach. Um, so that's the first item. And the second item is that uh, we, you may have seen it in the pre-slides on March 26th, next Friday, we will be having our fourth groundwater lunch hour uh, from 12.30 to 1.30. Um, people are advised to show up anytime during that time frame. stop in for a few minutes, head out, ask a question, uh, whatever works. And so we're gonna have that and we're gonna have a loose agenda covering some items um, and we'll have, uh, Myself, I'll be on to facilitate it. And then um, we'll have uh, uh, Michael Cook uh, to uh, kind of answer any technical questions. And anybody on this call is welcome to come on in. Uh, anyone on the tax, welcome to join and provide insight or hear what's being said. We usually have around anywhere from five to, I think we've had maybe as many as nine or 10 people on these calls. So it's just very informal. And what we plan to do as with these lunch hours is to continue to hold them. They're relatively low cost. And we'll hold them uh, over Zoom virtually. And then what we'll do is we'll have, um, as the chapters, I mean, the sections of the GSP start getting rolled out, we'll be able to use that as a forum to get some focused feedback uh, in a smaller setting too. So that's our plan for that. Um, so look forward for more of those. So again, March 26th, uh, from uh, Friday, March 26th, 12.30 to 1.30. And the Zoom information is available on turlockgroundwater.org. And those are my two brief updates. Thank you, Herb. Anything else to get in the order on Sigma updates? Um, I've got, uh, I guess, a brief update for the grant. Nothing huge. Um, we did re uh, submit the 
the latest invoice to DWR um, on uh, on both grants. And so uh, we're trying to uh, continue to get those in um, on, a, on a regular basis so that we can be reimbursed and uh, stay in compliance with the, with the requirements. So, um, so that was a, a big step. So thank you. Great, thanks, Debbie. Anything else from anybody? Okay, with that, our next meeting is scheduled for Thursday, March 25th, 2021, but it's a regular meeting. And with that, I had asked for a motion for adjournment from the West Turlock Subbasin GSA Tech. I'll motion. That was- Richard. Richard, thank you, Richard. I will second. Second by- Leandro. Leandro, thank you. Yeah. All those in favor, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, West adjourned. Kevin, over to you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, motion from the east side, please. Uh, this is Dennis. I'll move to adjourn. Thank you, Dennis. We're adjourned at 2.56. Okay. Take care, everybody. See you on March 25th.